Fox fans. Are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast with your hosts, Mike Walters and Eddie Jones. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. Welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Jones, and we have an interesting show for you this week. Maybe uh, not when you necessarily want to hear the information. Um, Last week, we were super excited. Uh, The Ducks had won three in a row. They were in second place in the Pacific Division. We were talking about, you know, the strong push that they were making. And, well, they had these last three games, and they basically laid an egg. Um, Unfortunately, the Ducks played Dallas and Nashville in back-to-back games. They ended up losing both those. Then they played St. Louis as well, and they dropped that one too. So now the Ducks are actually on the outside looking in. They're not even in a playoff spot at all now. So it's crazy how things can change in one week. So on this show, we're going to cover those games, obviously, as we normally do in the beginning. And then we're going to talk about the team, talk about some of these issues. You know, people are concerned about the defensive pairings. Obviously, there's some issues on the offense. A few other things that we're, you know, we'll address and kind of you know analyze. Uh, of course, we've got some fan questions as well. A lot of you are concerned about the playoffs, which, of course, makes sense. And some news about the uh, NHL All-Star game may be coming to Anaheim. So we'll talk about all that. Uh, also, we're going to have a watch party coming up, so we'll give that news out a little bit later in the show. But uh, let's look at these games, Eddie. I know you don't want to. Uh, but yeah. The... Um, the Nashville game. So the Ducks, uh, you know, went on the road as we talked about. Uh, they had that three-game win streak. Um, thought that they would go to Nashville wanting to get some revenge, and well, they kind of didn't come out with a lot of fire in the first period. Unfortunately, they um, kind of got dominated, really, to be honest. In the first period, uh, Nashville got a couple goals. They probably could have got some more if it wasn't for Gibson. Um, you know, in the way that uh, he was playing in this game uh, initially, and uh, Nashville built a lead. Uh, 3-0 after two periods. The Ducks did play better in the second half of this game. They actually ended up getting a couple goals. But, uh, Eddie, it was too little too late, and the Ducks lost this one 4-2. Yeah, this is like this is like bringing back uh, bad memories. This is the second time now I'm breaking down this game, and it's, it's a painful <laughs> one because uh, we, we knew this was going to be a tough game going into it. Nashville was, was on a nine-game winning streak coming into this game. They obviously made it 10 and that's as far as that would go. But they really dominated the Ducks for pretty much the first two periods. Like you said, they, the Ducks turned it on a bit in the second half of the third, uh, second half of the second, and going into the third period. But all three of the teams the Ducks faced this last week kind of felt like they had the book on the way the Ducks were going to play. Yep, uh, there was exactly. hard forecheck, really limiting their chances, not really overextending on offense, kind of picking their plays. We saw that a lot against Dallas, where. They were just picking their chances against the Ducks. And it, it, that was where it all started in this one. I mean, they got out to a 3 nothing lead, and the Ducks had a valiant effort trying to come back with Ricardo Raquel getting his 29th and 30th goals. But it was too big of a hole to come back from. I mean, at the end of the second, I said, well, you're pretty much done now. This is a team where they're not going to blow a three-goal lead. And, of course, they almost do. Um, and, and the Ducks made a good effort to get back into it, but the, you, this is you can't play 20 minutes against the best team in the National Hockey League and expect to win a game. I, I like the effort they had in the end, but you got to have that over the entire game if you're going to try and beat beat the National Predators. Yeah, I agree 100. percent I I think you know one of the big plays in this game too, Eddie, as you talked about in the second half of the second period, the Ducks were you know pushing, trying to get back into the game. They got a power play. You know, they were down 2-0. Then uh, Austin Watson gets that shorthanded goal. And at that point, I, I felt like you said, I thought this team was – sorry, they were done. I thought that yeah. was a backbreaker goal right then. Once they made it 3 nothing, and it was a shorthanded goal in the final, you know, minute 20 seconds or so of the second period, that's a huge backbreaker. I mean, if the Ducks would have gotten a goal and were down 2-1 to one going into the third, or even if it was still 2 nothing. Uh, you know, Raquel gets those two goals. Now we're talking about a, a 2-2 game with three and a half minutes to go, but that wasn't the case. And that's the the big play. I mean, there were a lot of plays, but if you want to talk about a momentum shifting play, Eddie, I think that was a huge one. And I think that's kind of a microcosm of what's happened with this team in the last three games is the special teams for the Ducks. I mean, it's just been terrible. They haven't been able to get anything going in these three games. You know, they were zero for two on the power play in Nashville. They're zero for three in the game against uh, 
Dallas and then zero for one in St. Louis. So, I mean, they didn't get any power play goals in these three games. And right here, that shorthanded one really uh, came back to hurt them in this game against Nashville. Yeah, and, and it ends up being the eventual game winner, and I think that's what yep. hurts even more is, you know, the the final goal, you really can't say too much about it. I mean, the Ducks were pushing hard. Fowler pinched a little bit forward, and, and that led to the two-on-one from Forsberg and Arvidsson, but that's expected when you're trying to get a goal in the final two minutes of the game. You're going to commit a little bit harder up the ice, and you're going to, you know, bleed some chances the other way. But for them to to give up a shorthanded goal in going into the the final few minutes of the second period uh, against two guys, I mean Austin Watson has been very good for Nashville shorthanded, but he's not one of their top guys, and neither is Colton Sissons, who originally had the breakaway that that Gibson got a first save on, and he made a good save on Sissons as well. Uh, but nobody tracks back and picks up Austin Watson, who can just tap in the rebound, and and I think that's kind of the disappointing thing. And the Ducks haven't given up a ton of shorthanded goals this year. And for them to to make that mistake there, I think that, like you said, is the game changer. That's what really turned this game in Nashville's favor and, and really tipped the tide and gave them the win. Yeah, because you could tell at that point in the game, the Ducks were making a push. They're trying to get back into it. You could tell that the ice was tilted in the Ducks' favor, you know, going into that final, you know, especially the last, you know, four or five minutes, and obviously until that goal. And yeah. that's just what I thought. I felt like you too. You know, once once you gave up, that goal you're down three nothing to the best team in the league going into the third period don't get me wrong i mean i'm hopeful i still watch the game and hope the ducks win but i gotta be a realist here i i knew it was going to be tough uh i i'm glad the ducks did try to come back and turn it on but too little too late and the thing that we've seen in these three games especially and of course we've talked about inconsistency but it's just been the 60 minute play that the ducks have not been able to in these three games, which is kind of important, Eddie, because you look at Nashville, they're going to make the playoffs. Yeah. You look at Dallas and St. Louis, probably one of those is going to make it, maybe two, I don't know, but but they're also playoff-type teams, and these are the teams that you need to have these kind of efforts against, and they just couldn't get it done. Yeah, and, and you're talking about having a full effort, full 60-minute effort, and, and that was the same thing in the game against Dallas, where... The Ducks played a good 40 minutes, and then they just looked tired, which I, I guess is fair because they played against Nashville the night before. But, you know, Getzloff opens scoring, gets it going. This is the line, I think, I believe, other than Grant goal this week, the Ducks' first line had all their goals, and that was it. Raquel had the first two in the game against Nashville. Getzloff had the only one in Dallas, and then Perry had the first one against St. Louis. So... The offense is kind of dried up. It dried up in this game. The Ducks only got one goal, ended up losing 2-1 to the Stars. And it was really just a late push by Dallas with two power play goals that got everything going for them. And the Ducks were pretty good up until that third period. And I think Dallas outshot them about like 18-5 to in the third period, ended up getting the two goals and, and were coming out with a win. And this one's kind of disappointing too because I felt like the Ducks probably deserved it until that third period. And then they just looked gassed. I mean, this is yeah. this is probably the most tired I've seen them after a back to back, and and it, I mean it makes sense the way Nashville played; they just grinded them down the entire game, uh, and it really showed in this, in that final twenty minutes. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, this game was kind of a flip flop of the Nashville game. The Ducks yeah. actually came out and played stronger. They still played a decent period, like you said. And then, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier in the show, special teams, you know, did them in. You know, they were zero for three on the power play. And then the Stars get two power plays. They score on both. You know, uh, Corey Perry closing his puck, on, uh, closing his hand on the puck. You know, it's he, you can't do that, obviously. Uh, Peterson get a penalty. You know, it is what it is on that play. He had to do what he had to do. But uh, I mean, you give up those two, and then you lose two to one. And I mean, it's a it's a backbreaker, um, really, because it, it was just a switch. You really thought after the two periods that okay, maybe the Ducks will hang on. They win this game one nothing, maybe get an empty netter, you know, two nothing, whatever, something like that. They come away with no points in this game, and you know, on this road trip, you know, two games, uh, two teams. You know, we thought that they would maybe win one of the two. We knew Nashville was going to be difficult, of course, especially being there. But we really thought that they could take care of Dallas after you know blanking them back home. So I mean, it's just a disappointing, uh, you know, road trip. I think the only <laughs> real highlight. And obviously, a lot of you uh, enjoyed those gifts and videos. Was uh, Kessler and Johansson going at it, Eddie? Um, that was the uh, you know kind of the uh, little SmackDown revenge. You know, we were kind of wondering if that was ever going to happen. Those two guys have been jawing at each other, 
and uh, someone decided to do the turtle. Uh, his name is not Ryan <laughs> Kessler. I'll tell you that much. Um, uh, you know, Kessler um, dodged a big uh, right by Johansson and then threw a couple. And uh, I don't know. Johansson went down pretty easy, in my opinion. But uh, that was probably the only highlight. I know a lot of people were, uh, thought it was great, but then of course they lost the two games. So I mean, it's a consolation prize. But uh, I did enjoy that part, uh, of course, and I think a lot of people did, Eddie, in this uh, two-game uh, road stand, but uh, or road trip. But you know, you wish they would have at least got some points, not just in fighting, but on the scoreboard. Yeah, and, and Kessler's kind of getting into a couple fights recently. He fought Taves in the game against Chicago, and now he's yep. fighting Ryan Johansson and. This felt like it was brewing for a long time, really, since the playoffs and before that, that uh, these guys were going to get together. This was the first game that they had played against each other all season since last year. So no surprise that they had, had things going. Kessel, I guess, trying to spark the team with the fight, uh, even though Johansson is the guy who actually jumps him off the faceoff. I don't even think uh, Kessler was 100% ready to... to really step into that fight but yeah he, he's the one who finishes it that's for sure <laughs> like you said he dodges the punch from Johansson and then just feeds him three or four rights and then uh Johansson turtles and and obviously that uh that gif we put out that I'm sure everybody saw <laughs> of uh of uh Kessler mocking Johansson for turtling so yeah that was awesome <laughs> that was great I'm, I'm not surprised um some people got a little bit mad about Kessler punching Johansson while he was down uh calling him uh I, sarcastically a tough guy but I mean we're not going to get too much into that I, I don't think we want to bash Kessler for sticking up for his teammates and, and uh, showing Johansson who's boss yeah especially you know you're you're talking all this mad trash on another player which you see this in all the sports everyone does it basketball football baseball soccer whatever everybody you know will say stuff about other players and everything but we all know Johansson's the one that made comments about Kessler's family yeah. and you just don't do that so, you know what? If Kessler throws in an extra punch here or there because of that, I say go for it. I mean, Johansson, he needs to learn to shut his mouth and not say certain things like that. If you want to talk trash on Kessler, fine. But to go after a guy's family, I mean, come on, dude. Yeah. So, you know, I, I thought it, you know, I thought what Kessler did is what I think probably 95% of you out there would do. Someone talk trash on your family, I don't think you would sit there and, and take it. And then if the guy jumps at you during the game, you're not going to swing on him? I mean, come on. So I don't know why some people were upset about that. But I, I think Kessler did the right thing. It's just unfortunate the Ducks didn't come away with the points. And, um, you know, the Ducks had another uh, scare, too, is, uh, you know, Manson got clipped in that Dallas game, too, on this road trip. Eddie he ended up getting a nice shiner. The video was was bad. I mean, when it started or when it happened, I, I man, I was like, please yeah. say his eye is not hurt. Um, you know, because that's the primary concern is, you know, is his health. And, whew. That play looked bad, Eddie, and the gift that we had on that one too. I was like, "Oh man, that mm-hmm. it just looked bad," and I, I, it looked like maybe it was an inch from his eye. I couldn't quite tell, but it was close. Yeah, I mean, it looked really, really bad when he first went down because he looked like he was in a lot of pain, understandably. But until you get that slow mo uh, angle that we ended up putting up, where you could see, I think it was Devin Shore or it was a Stars player, nonetheless, the skate coming up and, and hitting. Mads in the eye, and that could have been that could have been very bad for him. I mean, that yeah. could have been season-ending, uh, career-ending, career-ending if it was yep. like a, a cut on his eye and really damaged his eye. He was lucky that it was. It looked like it was just a probably a bone bruise, uh, maybe a small fracture. I don't. I, I doubt it though, because he played the next game, right? So it was right. probably just a bruise. It, it, it probably hurt like hell. That's why he, oh, he yeah. went down. Totally. You can obviously see. But he came back on, on the bench, had the nice shiner, like you said, and it looked like he was ready to go. Obviously was because he was in the game against St. Louis the next night, which is which is key for the Ducks. I mean, he's not their most valuable defenseman, but he's a key part to this team, and especially if the Ducks are going to make a push to get into the playoffs, they're going to need all four of their top four guys healthy. Yeah, absolutely, and <laughs> that's a big topic of discussion that we're going to get into after the St. Louis game because a lot of people – uh, you know, are concerned about the defense, which that's one part of the issue. We got to talk about the offense too in a minute, but um, we'll finish up the games here. That you know, they came back home, uh, they played St. Louis again. We thought, okay, they could win this one, <laughs> and no, it didn't turn out that way. So uh, St. Louis ended up getting a, a, a late goal in the first period uh, off some you know missed coverages and whatnot, and then they got an early goal in the second period and they built a two nothing lead. 
The Ducks came back. Uh, you know, Getzloff made a great pass to Corey Perry at the side of the net for pretty much a tap-in goal that brought the Ducks within one. Uh, of course, uh, St. Louis scored again to extend their lead, and uh, Derek Grant got one again and kind of went back and forth. The Ducks tried to get back within it, but they ended up dropping this one to Eddie. Um, you know, four to two. Some again, some you know mistakes, some turnovers, and coverages and things like that ended up costing the Ducks in this one. Of course, going to say it again, they didn't play a complete sixty-minute game, and uh, you know we find this team three-game win streak now, three-game losing streak. Yeah, and this was kind of similar to the way that Nashville played against Anaheim where St. Louis was relentless on the forecheck. They were pressing hard. Ducks couldn't really get anything going offensively, and the Blues were just picking their chances uh, when they got the when they got up the ice. I mean, the Bertuzzo goal was an example of that. They didn't really have a ton going. They were buzzing. They were, they were putting pressure on the Ducks, but they didn't get a lot of scoring chances. And then it's just a simple play. Shannon comes in, has a backhand drop pass to Pietrangelo. He passes it back to Bertuzzo, who's just wide open. I, I mean, I get it's Robert Bertuzzo, and you don't expect him to do much, but if you, you give anybody that much space and time, he's going to roof it, and he does on John Gibson. The Barbashev goal, again, I mean, it, it comes off, I think, Lindholm's skate off a shot, and it just kind of pops right out to Barbashev, and he gets to put it in, but that's the Blues' fourth line that is right. putting that in. And, I mean, it, it's a better, more skilled fourth line than you'd expect. I think they had Barbashev and Soshnikov on there, who are pretty good players to have on your fourth line. But still, I mean, you've, you've got to shut them down on chances like that. The Saboka goal, again, it's a puck that kind of comes out off a of bounce. Gibby doesn't do his best, really, getting over to make that save. I, I feel like he kind of expected Bar- uh, Saboka ever either to pass or just kind of get a tip on it. And he actually corrals the pass pretty well on his backhand and spins and puts it past Gibby. It was actually going wide, and it hits off Gibson's pad and goes in. I still don't want to fault him for it because, I mean, he's been so good for the Ducks lately. And then again, a trend continuing with the Berglund goal. He's left wide open, and Brodziak finds him, and he has all the time and space in the world to roof at top corner on, on Gibson. And you don't have guys that you would normally expect beating you where you've got Shen, who had one point in this game, Tarasenko and Schwartz left off the scoreboard, Alexander Steen left off the scoreboard, and you've got guys like Bertuzzo, Barbashev, Saboka, Berglin, you know, Brodziak. These are the guys that are beating you and getting points on the board. And we're talking about how the, the secondary scoring isn't there for the Ducks. This is what the Ducks need, really. A game like this where it's not just the first line getting getting goals and getting points for you. I mean, they're... The four, what did they had? Um, two against Nashville, one against Dallas, and two in this game. So four of their last five goals have all been from that top line. And the Grant goal last night was really against the pace of play. I mean, St. Louis was was dominating at, at that point in the third period. And Kelly just skates in and throws a puck on net, and it hits Grant and goes in. So not much you can really contribute to the offense on that one. But, yeah, the Ducks are going to have to get something going with the with the other lines. I mean, Henry Cash and Richie have been completely ghosted since they mm-hmm. were hot for so long they've just disappeared off the face of the earth kessler cogdan and silverberg have been like that pretty much all season other than a few games here and there so it's a big worry because i mean this is why we wanted them to add a guy at the <laughs> deadline and contribute to this offense because of this factor right here we knew eventually that henry cash and richie probably we didn't think they would go and disappear completely but they're going to slow down at some point and what a surprise it's happened and the Ducks are relying on one line to contribute to all their offense. Yeah, I mean, it's not the ideal situation uh, like you talked about. I mean, having, I mean, not only do you not have the secondary scoring, but then you get beat by the Blues and you shut down the All-Stars and the top players and you get beat by their, you know, secondary type scoring players. So, I mean, a very frustrating loss in that game. And I agree with you. I think... You know, a lot of people are talking about the defense, but we can talk about the offense. That's, um, you know, a, a big problem right now with this team is having that one line, you know, offensive production is it's not going to cut it. And, and we've seen it now. The Ducks aren't in a playoff spot now. So yeah. you can't just rely on Getzloff, Perry and Raquel now. I mean, you, you got to figure out something. And a lot of fan questions, you know, concerned about the playoffs. We'll get into that in a little bit. But I think we'll take a moment here, like you said, talk about the offense and what you need to do. I, I know uh, we did have one question from Jared. He asked about Chimera and Kelly and how they're doing and what we think. Honestly, I don't 
have much of an opinion of them, Eddie, as far as this whole thing goes, because we know with this offense that the fourth line doesn't play a whole lot. We also know that when the team gets behind in the third period, the fourth line is hardly out there. That's kind of what happens. I mean, I think that they're playing okay. I I don't think they're playing great. I don't think they're playing poorly. Um, They're not really out there enough. I think the big issue between this is what you talked about. It's the second and the third line. And how do you try to fix that? Because you have the Kessler line that's the shutdown line. And then you had the Henrique line that was scoring. Uh, you know, how do you try to balance that out? I think that, that's the main issue here. I, I like Kelly and Tremere as far as what they're doing. I don't, I don't think they're hurting the team any. But uh, they're not really out there a lot to have that much of an impact. Yeah, it's hard to hurt the team when you're playing about seven, eight, nine minutes a night. Exactly. I mean, they're not going to make a huge impact on a plus or a minus side of the ice. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can't complain with what they brought, but I think, like you said, we didn't expect them to come in and light the world on fire, really wow us right. on any night. I mean, last night, but it was against the pace of play. Kelly throws a puck to the net and it hits Derek Grant and goes in, and those are the type of goals I guess you expect that line to score. I would love to see JT Brown get back in the lineup. I know I think we saw him for one game of these three. So it would be nice to see him in there on a more consistent basis because I feel like he brings a little bit different aspect to his game. I think he's a little bit more offensive. And I would love to see him out there with Grant Chimera. So that would be a good fourth line to put out there. But, yeah, I, I mean, not too long ago we were looking at this top nine and when uh, Henry, Gritchie, and Cash were playing so well and saying, just wait till this top line gets going. And now, we'll look, Kessler, Silverberg, and Cogliano are going, this is going to be one of the best top nines in the NHL, and it's going to be difficult for teams to match up against them. And almost instantly right after that, the third line's offense dries up. Kessler, Silverberg, Cogliano kind of revert to what they were doing pri- prior to that for most of the season. And then the first line starts going on fire, but that's it. That's all that's going for the Ducks. And now this offense just looks anemic and... It's, I, I mean, I don't want to say it's something we didn't expect because, like I said, we did expect that third line to cool down eventually but not go ice cold and join the Kessler line in also going ice cold and having one line contributing all their offense. And and it's it's shown in the standings. Now the Ducks, like you said, are out of a playoff spot. They've sat in the bottom half of goals per game all season, and this is definitely not helping that when you've got just one line producing for you. Yeah, you know, it's kind of weird. I, I, I don't know why, but I'm kind of reminiscing on the SETI. But it's like you go back to the Korea Solani days when they had that top line. Yeah. Um, and everybody just focused on that. And then you remember back then they would, you know, split them up. And, you know, they'd put them together on the power play. They'd do all these different things and try and adjust. And so that's what I think part of the issue is here is what does Carlisle do to jump start this offense? Do you try to break up? Raquel gets off and Perry because they're they're doing well now and try and mix them in in the second and third line or do you try to mix the second and third line together and, and try and do something because we know the fourth line you take the fourth line out of it you can't really you know they're not they're not in there that much so I mean I guess the only other option is you leave it as is and you hope they do better which I don't think that's an option Eddie but what would you try to do would you try to mix up uh, Kessler and Henrique's line, or would you try to break up the first line and spread it out through the top three lines? I mean, how, how would you try to jumpstart this offense? What do you think? Yeah, they don't have a lot of options, really, because I don't think you're going to touch that first line, especially the way all three of them are playing right now. I mean, Perry's finally getting back on the scoreboard. Getzlaff and Raquel are just on fire uh, yep. right now. I mean, especially Getzlaff, he's just been killing it. I think he has a one goal and eight assists in his last five games, so he's been on fire pretty much for his last nine or ten games. I don't want I wouldn't want to touch that line. And you're not really gonna promote anybody off the fourth line. So then you're just really, really limited to what you could do. I mean you could swap around Cogliano with maybe Kasher or Richie, swap Silverberg with Katcha or or even Henrique, pop Henrique up onto the second line, pop Kessler down to the third line. But I, I just don't see it happening. I mean you rarely see that second line with Kessler or Silverberg Cogliano get split up. Right, and I feel like they're just waiting for Henry Cash and Richie to get things going again, and just hoping that this is a slump. But there's really not a lot of things you can do unless you're just going to completely re- rework the entire lineup. That means splitting up some either Perry or, or somebody on that top line, because you're not going to really see anybody get called up from San Diego as well. Because I don't think they bump anybody out of the lineup, even though the offense is struggling. I don't think they bump any, and they don't bump anybody out of that top nine. 
And um, something we talked about on the post game show last night was the Ducks don't have a lot of black aces coming up this year that can really right. that right. can really make a difference because Steele is going to be at the well, at the uh, Memorial Cup no matter what because they're hosting. Jones has been injured and his team's going to make a long playoff run. Maxim Comtois is on a very good team as well. All those guys are going to be still playing in their CHL playoffs most likely by the time the Ducks need them. And the only guy you could really think of is maybe Troy Terry, but the Ducks still haven't even signed him to a contract. So that's up in the air with that as well. So there's not a lot of help coming from anywhere outside of, of what the Ducks have currently. So uh, I, I think they're just sitting here and hoping, which is not a good thing to do when you've got 12 games left and you're sitting outside a playoff spot. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing you're talking about as far as the prospects, that's what you know Murray talked about at the um, the hot stove event a couple of weeks ago that we you know put that article out there with all the, the Q&A and stuff, and, and he touched upon all that. You know, he, these guys – most of them aren't going to be, you know, available until May. And it, I mean, some might not even be available unless the Ducks were to go, you know, really deep in the playoffs. So they are kind of stuck with the lineup of what they've got, as you mentioned. I think the only thing maybe that they could try to do, you touched on a little bit earlier, is maybe they throw Brown in the second or third line and try to jumble some stuff up. And maybe you, you put Richie on the fourth line or something. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's maybe the only other thing I could see. I don't see them putting Kelly and Chimera up there. I mean, you know, may, maybe they they try to do that um, and and mix it up that way. But you're right. It's 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 tough. I mean, you've got the shutdown line. You know, you've got the third line that was scoring so well. Now it's the first line that's scoring. They've kind of switched. And it's a tough spot. But, I mean, maybe that's the only other thing I could see is maybe they throw Brown in there. But, like you said, they don't seem too big on him. He hasn't been in all the games either. So the offense has got to get going somehow. And it's yeah. just unfortunate because the Henrique line was on fire. They stopped. Now the, the Getzoff line is the one that's doing the scoring. But if this team is going to make the playoffs, I mean, at least two of these lines need to get going. And I, I would make some kind of adjustment. I to me, I would probably move Brown in there and try and try that out for a couple games and maybe put someone else on the fourth line and see, um, you know, whether it's Brown and Richie spot or Cagano spot, something like that, and maybe see if that does something. Um, but I agree with you. It's kind of tough because we, we have these three lines and they've been kind of set, you know, for the last few games. So it's going to be tough. Uh, the Ducks need to generate some offense. They need to change up some things and get it going. Um before we get to the uh, – we're going to talk about the defense too because obviously that's an issue. Um, but we're going to do our little uh, giveaway thing that we've talked about. We talked about it on the last show, and we did it at the end. We didn't want to make you wait till the end. So we've given away tickets before in the past, and we're doing that again where this show and the show before and after this show. So the, these current three shows coming up, there's a keyword we give out in each show, and they make up a phrase when we finish the next show coming up. We'll uh, send out a little you know, message on social media and have you um, send in that phrase. And then basically we just randomly pick someone. So last week we gave out a word. Uh, this week the word is go, G-O, the word go. So you've got the first word from last week, the second word this week, and you'll have the third word next week. And then uh, we'll do the, the giveaway. So listen for that. Uh, we promised we wouldn't drag it out till the end. So <laughs> I want to make sure we did that. So just yeah. listen for that. And, and there will be two tickets we're giving away on April fools and it is not a joke we're being serious we are giving away the tickets that day uh two tickets uh, 400 level aisle seats almost center ice so um it, it's, it's a good giveaway so okay back with the team eddie uh, we talked about the the offense and how the ducks are you know trying to change things and it's stuck but uh, a lot more people were concerned at least in the comments that i saw and i think you saw about the defense and the defensive pairings and uh you know these last three games peterson was in, in the game against dallas but then you had bx and boschman and the other two and all kinds of people are upset. So <laughs> what do you think about the defense? Because, you know, they've been making some mistakes, some turnovers and things like that. Um, you know, is this the free Marcus uh, Peterson show or <laughs> what, yeah. what do you think? I know you, you mentioned that before. So what do you think about the defense and, the, you know, the issues there? Yeah, I mean, it seems like this. Uh, Jimmy, who's a fan of the show on Twitter, uh, tweeted at us before last game saying hashtag free Marcus Patterson. And, and that's kind of what it feels like a bit right now because <laughs> – I mean, not too long ago, I think it was the day before this when the Ducks were practicing, Eric Stevens put up the fact that Pedersen was practicing on the second power play unit, and it actually looked like he was going to start getting more responsibilities with this team, hopefully playing more than 12 minutes a night. Lo and behold, uh, they get into the game against St. Louis, and he's a scratch, and we've got Bieksa and Boschman playing together. 
Which, I mean, that's the best way if you're going to have them both in the lineup is playing them together <laughs> rather than put, splitting them up and, and kind of pulling down that pairing between Fowler and Montour, which, again, was good in the game against the Blues. So good thing they didn't do that. But the boschman Bieksa pairing, of course, was the worst of the night. Bieksa <laughs> was on the ice for three of the four goals against was kind of the at fault, I guess you could say, for one of the goals. I believe it was, uh, I think it was Berglund's goal. I'd have to double check, but he made a pass around the boards to Fowler. Fowler missed it, so they're kind of both at fault, but goes right out to the center and Berglund scores. So, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like, to me, a coaching decision to, to kind of sit him out, and it like it just feels like Carlisle's reasoning is that, hey, the Blues are a bit more physical. Let's throw in Bochum and Bieksa, which... I mean, it makes no sense. The Ducks were playing so well when they were able to put those guys in and out of the lineup every other night, get them a little bit more rest, and then they could come in and, and you know you don't feel the full effects of having them both on the ice at the same time. And it's not like Marcus Pedersen was lighting the world on fire either, but he's definitely a more mobile, better option than having Boschman or BX out there. So, I don't know. I, I really hope we see him against the Vancouver game. I hope this is just a couple, like a one-time thing. Maybe he had some underlying thing going on, which I highly doubt. I feel like it was just a healthy scratch by Randy Carlisle. But, yeah, I mean, if he's not in against Vancouver, we're going to have to keep going with this hashtag free Marcus Pedersen stuff because I, I don't think he's played his way off the lineup, and it really looked like he was starting to get some more opportunities with the Ducks. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of you out there, too, are, are just kind of like baffled and, you know, maybe think it's a little bizarre because, I mean, I watched him play and, you know, uh, kind of the same thing that we've talked about with uh, Kelly and Shamira. I mean, he's not knocking it out of the park, but at the same time, he's not making a lot of mistakes. I mean, he's not <laughs> doing the things that everyone's, you know, getting mad about when BX and Boschman are out there because, you know, there's certain plays and turnovers and and leaving guys, you know, open and different things like that, and everybody's getting upset. And, you know, I agree with you. I think you, you keep Fowler and Montour together. Obviously, Manson and Lindholm you keep together. But then the drop-off is just so huge with BX and Boschman, I think that's why most of you out there are upset, and I agree with you. I I mean, going forward, I don't know. It's just a no-brainer to me. Peterson should be in, and BX and Boschman should be rotated out. I mean, I, I mean, we got 12 games to go now. And yeah. now the Ducks went from second, you know, and we even talked about, oh, maybe they could get close to Vegas. Maybe not, you know, catch them, but they could get close. And now we're like, OK. Oh, it feels so stupid that we actually said that now. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean, I know we were so happy and up on this team last week and, you know, three games, and they flip flop. And it's like, really? Yeah. So but I, I, I didn't agree with those decisions with Carlisle, especially in uh, the St. Louis and the Nashville game because the Ducks ended up giving up four goals in those games. And you, it's just – I don't like the drop-off. I, I agree with yeah. you. I think you got to keep the other the others together. But if you're not going to break those two up on there and, and, and either have Lindholm helping out one of them like they've done before or something, don't put them both in the lineup. You just can't. you got to put uh, Peterson in there and rotate them out. I mean that, that's just what they need to do. I mean I think it's a lot – simpler of a fix on defense and offense i think offense you know we talked about it. I, th I think that's a little bit more yeah. tricky given the chemistry between the lines and whatnot but to me you know i'm no coach whatever but from what i've seen from you know uh peterson in the last couple of weeks eddie i mean <laughs> come on i mean you put him in and you rotate out the other two i i don't have anything else to say i just that's yeah. what needs to happen on the defense and if the ducks do that they'd be fine because they were winning games before when they did that and now he got away from this and we're losing games i mean that's not the only reason uh, don't don't get me wrong i know a lot of people are i saw on twitter everyone's flaming out on carlisle and and this whole decision which i agree with you i, I hey i think it's the wrong call but there are issues on offense, too. It's not just this. That's why the Ducks are not doing well. But it definitely doesn't help Eddie when he's all of a sudden changed his thinking with the defensive pairings. Yeah, I think that's the key thing to mention is is having Pedersen in the lineup last night probably still wouldn't have won the Ducks the game. I mean, yes, BX was on the ice for three goals against, but it doesn't mean he was at fault for all three of those goals. There were also four other players who were on the ice for right. those goals as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, it's an issue having them both in there. Um, 
but having Patterson in there doesn't make this team that much better. We're like, oh, now all their problems are going to be solved and they're going to start right. winning games like they were when he was in the lineup. Because, I mean, the, the, right. the big thing with a lot of people is what they're looking at is their the success when they were rotating in and out. The Ducks, I think they were like 7-1-1 one, and one in those nine games that, that Patterson had come up and was playing in with Boschman and Bieksa kind of alternating in and out. And then since they've switched back to having them both in the game together, the Ducks haven't looked that great. But that's not the reason. I mean, the Ducks' offense also has dried up in that time. There's a lot of things going on. Goaltending is still there, but they're kind of getting hung out to dry uh, in a yep. lot of games. They're not getting a lot of run support. So, yeah, um, I, I think this kind of leads into a question we had as well. Somebody was asking if we'll resign um, Bieksa at the end of this season. <laughs> and it's uh... interesting because we mentioned this before. We think if it, it feels like the team likes him, so it would be something like they would offer him like a one, one and a half for one like one year kind of contract which i would honestly hate because if for me i would love to just get an opportunity to, to see them not in the lineup for one game and, and i was talking about this yesterday as well just seeing maybe i know they're both lefties but Pedersen and larson together as a pairing in one game as a bottom pairing for the ducks just to see how they would do we haven't seen larson at all this season and i would love to right. see him up here even Pedersen and walensky or something of that nature, just not having them in the lineup and just seeing what a third pairing that didn't consist of one of them could do. But if he comes back and he does get a contract, it feels like that's something we won't see for a while because I feel like he'll still probably play 40, 50 games next year, even though he's on a one-year low contract and as a guy, guy that should be considered as a seventh defenseman, he'll still find his way into games. Yeah, I think that's the concern. If he comes back for a low price, I, I don't think too many people will be upset about it. But then if he plays a lot of games, like you said, I think that's where the issue is going to come in. And, you know, it's kind of funny, too, while we're, we're recording this show, Eddie. You know, there's people on Twitter talking about Bieksa. People are upset. And they're like, Ducks, just, you know, get rid of Bieksa. Uh, you know, just keep in mind, he has a no movement clause, like a full no movement clause, which means he can't go anywhere, not even to the minors. He has to agree. So he's going to be with the team these last 12 games. And then, you know, hopefully the Ducks make the playoffs. I, he can't go anywhere. So <laughs> I know people want him gone now. Some people do, but that's not going to happen. But as far as next season, I personally don't want him back. Uh, if it's a real low amount, I, I'm good with that, Eddie. But, I mean, it, it's just tough right now because yeah. you see these games and you see some of these mistakes. And I get it. You see the mistake. And trust me, they're not out there like, oh, I made this mistake. Yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, they get upset. They're human too. And like you said, there's other players on the ice too. I mean, it's just the problem is is you see a glaring mistake by a, a certain player and it happens a handful of times. It has, and it leads to a goal, and that's what's unfortunate. But there's other times that players make mistakes, and they don't lead to a goal. So it's tough. You got to watch. You got to try to be objective and watch all those mistakes because we only remember the ones where the you know the ducks get scored on, and then you sit there and go, you know, whatever favorite cuss word you use as you're watching the game, Eddie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of work that around because. Um, I think a lot of us don't want him back next year. And, and I don't want to say that all of – every time he's on the ice, he's making a mistake and everything that happens right. while he's on the ice is his fault because it's not true. But right. there, there's a reason that you know there's a lot of hate towards him and, and a lot of things – negative thoughts going towards him is because there, there are a lot of times he's out there and, and he's the reason – that a uh, goal is scored, whether it be a turnover or a mistake or, or something like that, or he gets burned by a, another player. So I get it. He's an older guy, and I understand that you know he doesn't keep up as much, but uh, I think that's where a lot of people are, are getting upset. But uh, do you have any more fan questions from the Twitter side? Because I have a couple on Reddit, if you don't. No, we can go with those, and then uh, just really a lot of concern about the playoffs. We can kind of wrap up with that. Perfect. Well, we got a couple questions on Reddit because we've been trying to get some more questions from there as well. So we had uh, Molly's Yes on Reddit ask, what makes this team so inconsistent? And I know we could probably talk about this for 20 minutes, but let's kind of <laughs> let's kind of just settle it down a bit. I, I want to know what you think and, and just kind of a brief thought on that question. Well, well we talked about uh, the offense and the defense. Obviously, we talked about the third pairing on the defense and whatnot and those issues. Everyone's well aware of that. Oh, you kind of beat that horse. 
to me, one thing I, I see that's a problem, Eddie, is the special teams. That yeah. That's, to me, kind of been a huge issue with this team is they'll go through some periods where they'll be able to, you know, do what they got to do on the power play. And then, you know, like this last week, they've just nothing. They haven't scored. They, they gave up a shorthanded goal. Um, they gave up those, you know, two power plays at Dallas in the uh, third period there, and they gave up goals on both of those. So that's one issue I've seen with this team is the inconsistency – uh, has come from the special teams. I know that maybe they haven't talked about that as much, but it's kind of been a concern because, you know, there's been uh, seasons in the past where the Ducks were really, really good on the special teams. And and this year, you know, they're just not doing it. I mean, you look at the power play, they're at uh, 17.8%, which is 23rd in the league. Uh, the penalty kill is not terrible. It's at 82.6%, which is actually, you know, pretty decent. They're they're up there uh, tied for 8th or ninth, however you want to look at it. So the penalty kill has been pretty good. But um, I, I think more of the issue just leans on them trying to score with the extra man. It seems like, you know, we get the power play over and over again. And <laughs> even when I'm at the games, it's like <laughs> – you know, people around me are so frustrated when they get a power play. And I think a lot of it is not just that they don't score on the power play, Eddie, because, of course, people are, uh, you know, getting frustrated. I get the comments when we're tweeting out, you know, the updates on the games. And, you know, I put that they don't convert. I almost don't even want to tweet it out anymore because yeah. everyone's <laughs> all pissed off. And then the people sitting around me, too, are, are getting pissed. But I think the issue that it comes down to, especially on the power play, is really getting into the zone – and getting set up, I don't know what it is with this team. It seems like they're able to, you know, get into the neutral zone, but and I don't want to go back to the Carlisle dump and chase type thing, but they don't carry the puck in. And I know this was a concern you and I talked about before Carlisle came back. And I think five on five they've been okay, but for some reason on the power play, I don't know why they're not trying to just bring the puck in and get set up as much. I, I think, like you said, some of the teams kind of have the book on the Ducks. They're clogging up the neutral zone and forcing them to do that. But um, I, that's where I see the issue is is, is just the entries on the uh, power play and you know the forecheck. They're just not able to get set up and not get sustained pressure in there consistently on power plays. Yeah, I agree with both of those. And, and I think they stem from what my answer is going to be. And I, I think Probably a lot of people don't know where this is going to be going, but <laughs> I think it's it's coaching. To be honest, um, I'm not going to sit here and say Carlo is the worst coach in the league, but he's by f- not really even close to the top 15, top 20. I think he's in that bottom half of the league, and and his coaching style and his ability to change things on the fly because he doesn't really do it. I mean, this right. team has pr- played the pretty much the same way all season. Really, since they've got healthy, they haven't played any different. They've kind of got by on their goaltending, and they're just raw talent on this team. And and I the think this, yeah. yeah, I think this is a team who has played well since Christmas, has played well since everybody's been healthy, but they're not really playing at their full potential. I think a lot of that comes down to coaching because in these last three games, like we have said already, the, these other teams have kind of had the book on the Ducks, and they really haven't changed up their play. They've just let that happen, and. I mean, there's no reason for that. I mean, I, I get it, and you know, Nashville's a tough team to play. Dallas is a tough team to play. St. Louis as well is a, is a team fighting for their lives in the playoffs. But you've got to be able to change up your play if things aren't working. The Ducks don't really do that, and I think that leads to their inconsistency as well. And then another thing, again, going to the coaching aspect, there's a lot of times where the Ducks actually have a lead going into the third period, and they continue to just coast along. Yes. And they switch up their play as if just to sit back on their heels and let things kind of play out. Yep. And that's hurt them in a lot of a lot of cases so far. I mean, even games where they haven't lost and they've actually been able to hold on and win, there's a lot of times where they just get caved in in the third period and they just continue to let it happen. It's like, oh, well, we won the game. Who cares? Nothing, nothing bad happened. Let's keep doing it. And you, know, you can't continue to play like that. And unfortunately, I don't think it's going to change. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't want to hate on Carlo because I feel like he should get some credit for what they were able to do at the beginning half of the season with the, all the injuries they had. Just still even being in the mix is amazing. But it's not all his credit. I mean, you know, at least half of it has to go to, to John Gibson and Ryan Miller and their play and then the guys that were in the lineup. But, yeah, I, I think that's kind of the root of the issue is he just gets outcoached on a regular basis by, by a lot of uh, different teams in the, in the NHL. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, too, on that. I, I think part of the issue, too, and, and, you know, you and I have really talked about this for 
I don't know, probably since we started the show. But it goes back to the third period like you talked about. And there's not really that killer instinct from the Ducks. Um, you know, like you said, they get that lead. And, okay, you know, we're up by two or three goals. we got 20 minutes to go. We can just hang out, you know, run the clock out, and we'll be fine. And it's really irritating. <laughs> and I, I know other people have seen that, too. Same thing when I'm at the game. People, are, they get super restless in the third period when, when stuff like that happens. And we've seen it where maybe the Ducks n- not necessarily lost in the third period, but, you know, the other team comes back and ties. It goes into overtime. And they're like, great, because, you know, three on three and shootouts, we're not the greatest in the world at that. So, I think you're right as far as the in-game changes. There there hasn't been a lot. And I think, you know, um, when the, the lines aren't scoring or someone's not producing or, or someone is having an off night on the defense, I, I think, you know, he, he does make changes during the game. It's not like he doesn't make any. But I just – I don't know. I just don't think he always has his, uh, you know, finger on the pulse um, in that third period for some reason, Eddie. I, I, it's like – I don't know. The Ducks need like nodos or something in the third period. I, I don't know, or a monster or something. I mean, <laughs> it's just like they kind of they kind of get re- too relaxed or too comfortable. And um, I don't think Carlisle really takes control of the ship in that in, in that situation. And I think you're right. It, it leads to some of the the inconsistency where they'll play well for 40 minutes and then the last 15 or 20 they're kind of hanging out and they can't do that. I mean, and if this team's going to make the playoffs, which we'll get into in a little bit too, I mean. They're going to get blown out in the first round if they're going to have that mentality. Yeah, and, and that leads into the second question we had uh, on Reddit from Kitties. He said, if the Ducks don't make the playoffs, would it be Carlisle's fault? I know he kept the team afloat during the first half of the year, but this, but it seems like his coaching decisions have been questionable as of late, and he refers to icing Boschman and Bieksa and benching mm-hmm. Patterson. And we, we kind of just went into depth on that, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I, some of it has to be his fault, but unfortunately I think we all saw the comments from Bob Murray in The Athletic where he feels like he's almost pushed the blame on the fact that the Ducks have had some injuries this year, Kessler's not 100%, and he's just said, oh, you know, he's pretty much said, oh, we'll be better next year. You know, we don't have to change much, we'll be better next year just based on the fact everybody will be healthy at the beginning of the season. And, and you no, know, obviously I tend to agree with that, but it almost pushes all – the blame off of Randy Carlisle's shoulders. Like they could finish, uh, like eight and twelve. They could they could lose eight of their last twelve, and I feel like it wouldn't even matter to Randy Carlisle's situation. I, I feel like Murray firmly believes that this team uh, is better than they're playing right now, and that if they're able to be 100 percent healthy at the start of next season, it doesn't really matter how they finish this year. It's not really going to affect Carlisle, but but he does in my opinion, have to be at fault if they don't make the playoffs, at least some of it. I mean, there are, there are other guys you can blame. I think you can ba- blame Murray as well for not really doing anything at the deadline to make this team any right. better. Um, and then you have to blame the system as well, the coaching, system coach and everything in that. So there, there's a lot of people to blame, but he has to be part of it. Yeah, I think that's the scary thing. And I think that's what a lot of fans were upset about is those those comments that he had back when we talked about that athletic uh, interview. You know, it, he just kind of seemed like, OK, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to push for next year. Basically, it, it's what it kind of seemed like, because obviously he only brought in Chimera and Kelly, you know, no, no big names, but they didn't really get anybody. You know, we talked about that. We've, we've had a, like a live show for four hours on that. So, you know, we, I'm not going to go all back into the trade deadline and all that, but you know, obviously the ducks didn't add anybody significant at the trade deadline. And I agree. I, I think it's kind of weird. It's like, Hey, if the ducks don't make the playoffs, um, I think, Yes, there should be some blame on Carl. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I give him credit in the beginning of the season, like you said. I think uh, Gibson and Miller carried this team a lot in the beginning. I think some of the younger guys that came up and stepped up when they had to uh, in the beginning of the season also deserve some of the credit, too. So there's a lot there. But I don't think Carlisle's going to go anywhere at the end of the season if the Ducks don't make the playoffs. I don't, I don't see him. You know, unless the Ducks collapse and lose the next 12 in a row – Mm-hmm. And get like blown out in every single game, which I highly doubt that's going to happen. But I, I don't see that happening. Um, but yeah, I do give him a little bit of blame, and that's that's why I'm, um, you know, as far as this team right now being inconsistent on the special teams, uh, not, no killer instinct in the third period. You know, there's some issues there, and I, I don't know if he's going to fix them in time. I mean, I still think this team can make the playoffs. I mean, you you look at what's going on. Um, yeah, they're on the outside looking in. I mean, they're tied, you know, as of right now, depending on how some of these other games pan out, 
um, for that second wild card. And, and uh, as we all know, you win two games, it's like you jump four spots. You lose two games, you go down four spots. So it's not all gloom and doom. I still think this team can uh, you know get into the playoffs. But as far as uh, getting them over that hump, I, I think it's a huge issue. I don't know if Carlisle is the person that's going to be able to do it. But I think, like you said, too, some of it has to go back to Murray, too. I mean, you're, you're given a, a deck of cards, and you're trying to play with that deck of cards, and that's what you got. And, I mean, I know some coaches are better at it than others. Obviously, as you said, there's some great coaches out there that can do it. But the GM's got to kind of help you out, too, and not just kind of be like, okay, you know, this team's just not playing where it's at, and, and they'll just get better. Well, I mean... <laughs> That, that's a good philosophy, but sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes they need a little kick in the butt or you need to add something into the mix to make it work. And I, I think that's what a lot of the fans are concerned about, Eddie, is that there is nothing. I, like you said, you can't really bring up anybody from the minors. You can bring up a couple people maybe, like you mentioned, Larson, you know, or Walensky on defense. But a lot of these guys are tied up in their playoffs with their teams because they're hosting different things. Um, Jones is injured, as you mentioned. So there's not a whole lot that you can bring. I mean, the only thing I mentioned was Brown because, as you talked about, Brown's an energy-type guy. Maybe you throw him in there and he gets in the mix. We've seen him scrap and things like that. I mean, that's all that this team really has right now. It's, it's unfortunate, but the situation as it is now, the Ducks are kind of locked into what they have. And I, if they don't make the playoffs, I, I do blame Carlisle a little bit, but I aim it at Murray too. Yeah, and I think this transitions pretty nicely into talking about the Ducks' playoff hopes and how it looks right now. And, you know, they've, they've got uh, one game over, so pretty much everybody around them has a game in hand except for Colorado, who has two games in hand, and Calgary is on the same amount of games played. So I think we can talk about kind of what the the outlook will look like after tonight because, I mean, after the Dallas game, the Ducks got some luck where San Jose, yes. L.A., Calgary, Dallas, they all lost – Yep. The Ducks were extremely lucky that they didn't get to, those teams didn't pick up points on them, and of course they lose against St. Louis, and we have San Jose and LA both win. So, do you look at tonight? San Jose doesn't play, LA does, Dallas does, Colorado does, Calgary does. So the, those games at hand are going to be made up tonight. LA could realistically end up being three points in front of Anaheim. Dallas could be four. Colorado could be up two with a game in hand. And Calgary could be tied on points with uh, the Ducks having a game in hand. This could go really, really bad for the Ducks tonight. I mean, <laughs> if, if all of those teams win and pick up points, you're looking at a, a, a big climb to get back into it. And I know three points isn't much to be made up, but with only 12 games remaining, it's going to be tough. And it would be against the Kings, so you do have that one game remaining against the Kings, which is going to be massive. I mean, that yes, game is just going to be the huge. Month. So... Yeah, I mean, they're in the hunt, and I think that's all we can ask for, especially after this season and, and how it's it's been, especially with the injuries. But it's going to be disappointing if they don't make the playoffs because they're kind of they've kind of dwindled themselves a bit out of the wild card race with Dallas and Colorado heating up again, and it's going to be hard to knock any of those two teams out of there. So they really got to focus on picking up points on and LA and San Jose, but. You know, they don't have any more games against San Jose left. You can pretty much have to hope that other teams can beat them, and they've been playing very well lately. And you've got that one game against L.A. You're going to have to win that game and then also hope yes. that L.A. gets beat by other teams and that you can continue playing some consistent games. I mean, the Ducks don't have a lot of hard opponents now that they've got those games out of the way. I think right. the next game is against Vancouver. Then you've got Detroit, New Jersey, Calgary, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Vancouver, and L.A. I mean, the hard game for the rest of this month is Winnipeg. Yep. And the most important game is the game against LA. And then even going into the games in April, you've only got four and you play Colorado, Minnesota, Dallas, and Arizona. I mean, the only hard one I would, I would, I guess Colorado, but really is Dallas again. I mean, they've got a very winnable last 12 games and they've got a, a majority of them at home as well. Other than that four game road trip, plus the last game of the season. So you've got seven of these last 12 at home you got to pick up seven, eight, nine wins if you're going to make it into the playoffs. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think of these last games, I think the Ducks need to win eight or nine of them at least. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I mean, they have to. I mean, this coming week, they've got Vancouver, Detroit, and the Devils. And I think part of the thing, too, that we've kind of hit this along the season, too, is uh, you know going back to those questions about inconsistency and all that. We've kind of talked about the coaching and special teams and different things what's going on but you know part of it too is the level of play the ducks bring against opponents 
I don't know what it is, Eddie, but when they play certain teams, they don't perform. And, and I mean, Nashville's one, but Nashville's a good team. But some of these teams, I mean, you know, they're playing Detroit again, and they didn't have a great game against Detroit earlier in the season. And, you know, they, we've seen some of these where they play these teams that aren't in the playoffs, and, I mean, they should beat these teams or they should play, you know, better against these teams. And it seems like they play down sometimes to the level of their opponents, which is part of the inconsistency we've seen this season. So that's, I think, going to be the tough battle here going into the rest of the, the, the season. As you mentioned, you look at all these games, most of these teams aren't going to the playoffs. You're playing Vancouver twice. They're not going. Detroit's not. New Jersey's not. You have Calgary that's kind of on the fence. Obviously, Winnipeg is going to be tough. You have the Kings, which, I mean, every game is tough, you know, uh, against the Kings. And then you have Dallas. So most of these opponents are not, you know, tough teams. So, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's just not really a sense of urgency with this team at times. And I think that's part of the frustration is they should play Vancouver like they're playing the Kings. I mean, that's kind of – and I know that's not realistic. I mean, you, you know, when you're playing the Kings or Sharks, you're amped up. That's your rival. You want to, you know, take it to them. But – I'm saying now we're in this final three, four weeks, you got to play every game like, I mean, it's like do or die. Like, you got to win this game or else you're out. I, I mean, that's how the Ducks have got to be now because they didn't have to be like that. But once they lost those three games, now they put themselves in that position. If they would have at least won one of these games, maybe two, which you and I thought they would have, they would have been at least in a better position. But now they've got mm-hmm. no games in hand. And they've got to beat these teams and they've got to have that sense of urgency or else, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to be done come April. Uh, what is it? Uh, April 7th. You know, April 8th is going to be the, the depressing show. I mean, you know, that that's all I can really say about it. the Ducks have got to have a sense of urgency. Yeah. And, and I mean, out of these 12 games, I think all of them are winnable games except for the game against Winnipeg. And I don't want to say the Ducks are going to lose that game, but the gap in talent is significant between Winnipeg and, and Anaheim, even the other teams that they're playing. I think Winnipeg is just on that next level of teams in, in the same category as Nashville and Tampa Bay, Vegas, you know, Boston as well. So I think that they're a little bit up there. But I mean all these other teams are, are teams that the Ducks should be beating or at least should be competing against. And you look as well, the Ducks don't have any back to backs until the final two games of the season. Realistically Gibson should be able to play all of these games. I think if if you're in a position you are right now, this is why you have a number one goaltender. This is why you have a guy you can rely on. I feel like no matter what, he's got to play the majority of these games. He's got to play at least 10, 9 or 10 of these games for the Ducks and play well. And I wouldn't put it past him because of how well he's played lately. But, you know, he doesn't necessarily even have to share the net because of of the fact that they don't have any back-to-backs. He could play all of these games until the last game of the season, depending on where the Ducks are that Miller could get that game against Arizona. And hopefully by that time, the Ducks are in a playoff spot and it doesn't matter. But we, we really don't know. And, and it's it's a disappointing kind of stressful situation to be in, I think, for everybody because we're not used to the Ducks being in this spot with only 12 games remaining where they're really just on the cusp of making the playoffs. And it's either going to be excitement or disappointment because they're not going to miss out by a lot. They're either going to barely miss out or they're going to barely get in. And... It's it's exciting and, and nerve wracking, like I said, being in this position. Because normally by this time the Ducks are either on top or close to being on top in the Pacific Division, and we really can just coast by and talk about the playoffs and who their first round matchups right might be. And now we're talking about are they even going to make the playoffs? Which is is definitely definitely a unique situation. I don't think we've been in since we started the show. Yeah, and the and as you mentioned, Eddie, the Ducks. Uh, you know, usually are fighting out for first place, and, and this is one of the few times that now they're fighting out to barely make it in the playoffs. And if they do, I mean, some of these opponents that they're going to face, it's just going to be difficult. You're looking at, you know, if you're the second wild card, you're looking at Nashville or Winnipeg. Um, you know, if you're the fourth team in the Pacific, you're looking at Vegas. I mean, it's going to be tough if the Ducks, not only do they get in, but if they squeak in, they're going to be playing some tough teams, so they really need to ramp it up at in these uh, these couple weeks, especially against these uh, you know non playoff type teams. Yeah, and, and before we forget, uh, I got to give a shout out to the newest patron that we have on Patreon as well, Tom Vincent. He's uh, set up for the the five dollar reward, so he's uh, eligible for a shout out on uh, on our show right here. So dang, thanks to Tom for setting everything up as well, and uh, also before I forget. Uh, Matt Angle uh, hit me up on tw- on uh, Facebook actually, 
and was saying how much he appreciated the show and, and how much uh, you know he was considering uh, donating to the, the Patreon and helping support the show. And he said he was instead he was going to set up a uh, a GoFundMe to get me uh, to Anaheim for a playoff game, which I thought was was pretty funny. So. I mean, hey, if you guys want to to hit up Matt Matt Angle, uh, sorry Matt Angel on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, I mean, I, I think he's setting up a GoFundMe to try and get me there. Uh, thanks for the support either way from Matt. Uh, it was really appreciated just him reaching out to me, and we had a good discussion about everything that's been going on with the show and, and how much he enjoys listening. So thanks to Tom, thanks to Matt, thanks to everybody that has supported the show so far, and uh, anybody that supported us on Patreon. And just get back to what you were saying before, uh, it's going to be an exciting week coming up, especially with these teams you should beat in Vancouver, Detroit, New Jersey. We've, we've already mentioned this multiple times on the show and on how those are games the Ducks should be winning, especially the fact that they're all home games before you have that mini Western Canada four-game road trip against Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg. So, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully by the time we come back on this next show, the Ducks have won at least two or three of the, the these next games coming up and we can have a better outlook of, of what their playoff chances are going to look because, I mean, by the time we have our next show, they're going to have less than 10 games remaining on the season. Can't believe we're already that far in the season, but, yeah, I mean, who knows what their playoff outlook is going to be look like at that point. I mean, you've got the, the battle is just so tight right now. I mean, any win or loss, any lost points or any gain points on the other teams are just huge. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be back probably after the uh, the game against the Devils. So we'll recap those three games. So probably on the 19th or the 20th, we'll have the next show. And then also on the 21st, we're going to have a watch party at El Ranchito in Orange. So you can join us for that. Um, and then uh, also don't forget, we have the post-game show. Uh, Eddie does that with Patrick, uh, the Forever Mighty um fm is the twitter and it's also on spreaker as well we've been posting out the links they're also being posted in the game recaps and previews too so if you don't see it there it's there as well check that out we're trying to you know doing two podcasts now basically so (laughs) trying to get you guys you know ramped up for everything so with that uh let's hope for some wins we we're we're hoping they get two or three of these games uh down and uh let's go ducks 